If you want to write high quality, easy to maintain code, type safety is one of the most important things to consider. And with modern tools like TypeScript, it's become easier than ever to create type safe code. But one area where this has always been lacking is the communication between a client and a server. For example, when you make API requests, the type safety between your API and your client is almost always lacking, and it makes it difficult to make type safe requests to your server. Now, there are things that have tried to fix this, such as GraphQL. But the main problem with GraphQL is it relies on code generation to give you that type safety and it also completely throws out the entire REST based model that we're used to. So it makes writing code a lot harder since you need to learn an entirely new way to write your code. This is why I really love TRPC because it's very similar to the standard REST practices you're used to, but it gives you amazing type safety, even better in my opinion than GraphQL and it's so much easier to use. I'm super excited to say that Mailgun is sponsoring today's video. Mailgun is one of the best services to handle emails that you can use as a developer. And I actually started using Mailguns a few years before I even started this YouTube channel and I absolutely love it. The thing I really love about Mailgun is just how great their API is and how easy it is to implement into your application and it makes doing anything email related just a breeze. Mailgun also does so much more than just send emails since you can also do contacts, marketing campaigns, and so much more. They also have a really great UI for managing everything on the back end and it also gives you really in-depth analytics information to make sure your emails are getting sent when you want and how you want them to. They also have a really cool feature called send time optimization which just makes sure that your emails are sent at the time that the actual person receiving them is most likely to open them which again helps with your deliverability and open rates. And I just want to say thanks again to Mailgun for sponsoring this video. If you want to try them out today, you're going to want to go to the link mailgun.com slash webdev. That's also going to be linked in the description and the comments for you. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. And in this video, I want to talk about TRPC and why it's so amazing. Now, TRPC is essentially a library that helps you communicate between a server and a client generally for doing some like API calls. And it just makes that whole setup really easy and it also makes it fully type safe. But in order to understand the true benefits of TRPC and why it's so amazing, the best thing we can do is actually look at an example of a site not using TRPC and then looking at what it looks like with TRPC to see the differences between the two. So I've done exactly that. Here I have two different projects. One is using a normal REST based structure and the other is using TRPC and they're both very simple projects and they have the exact same code in them other than that one is using normal REST practices and the other is using TRPC. So if we first look at our REST based code, what we have here is we have a simple, you know, express server. So this is express right here. You can see we have port 3000 and we just have an index route and a user route for defining our different routes. So if we go here into this index routes page, you can see that we have a route for getting a greeting. So we pass it a name. It'll say, hello, Kyle, or whatever your name you pass it. As you can see, that's the example we're using right now. This route will just return an error to me so we can kind of test how errors work between these two systems. And then in this user section, things are a little bit more complex, but essentially we have a way to get a user by passing an ID and we have a way to create a user by passing it a name and an age. And as you can see here, we have a list of users being stored. Now in our main file, all we're doing is we're using Axios to make some requests to our server. And those requests are going to give us back information. As you can see here, I have all the other requests commented out. I'm just going to kind of quickly go through this application and show you what this does. So the very basic example is a greeting. So we can make a request to that localhost 3000 slash greeting, which will just bring us to this route right here. And if we do that, it's going to take in a name, which we pass in through the params, and then it's going to return to us some data, which is going to be our result. And if we hover over the result, you can see our const result has a type of any because our type system doesn't know what the API returns. But as you can see, it's returning to us a string that says, hello, Kyle, pretty straightforward and simple, because if we look at this code, you can see it's returning hello and then whatever name we pass it. Now, in order to prove that all these different routes are working, I'm just going to uncomment all of this other code real quick so we can see that this is all working. I'll move my camera just out of the way real quick expand this and as you can see we're getting hello kyle being returned this is the error message that's being returned so we can actually see that errors are working this is querying a bunch of different users there only have two users so the other four are undefined and this is just a user that's created and then querying that brand new user that we just created pretty basic and simple stuff right here so all these different queries are working I just move my camera back to where it was before and they all work pretty similar you know you do a request to your client you pass in the url you pass it the different parameters or in the case here where you have a body, you pass it the body, and then it's going to do what you need it to do when you're using like get and post request to do all that kind of stuff. It's pretty simple and pretty straightforward, 
but the big problem comes in when I try to change things. So let's comment all this back out so we just have our simple greetings right here. I can come in here and what if I wanted to change this to say slash greetings instead of slash greeting? Well, if I run my code, I click save, and I just come over here and I refresh, you're going to notice we're immediately going to get an error saying that obviously this URL doesn't exist. But in my code, I have no errors. There's nothing in my actual code telling me something's wrong. I have to actually run the program and then I know, oh, this should say greetings instead of greeting and now it's going to work. Or if I change this from being a name inside of here to like names, oops, not that one, on this one up here, if I change this to be names, for example, well then now I need to make sure I change that down below because if I refresh, obviously we're getting an error, so I need to change this here to names as well. So this is where a lot of the problems come in because there's no type safety between your server and your client. Like I said, this result, we don't know what the type of our result is. We don't know if it's a string, is it a user? Is it some massive thing, is it undefined? I have no idea. I just need to memorize what my API returns and hope I don't type anything wrong or I need to manually type this. I could say result here is going to be a specific type. So I could say like, I could return this as a string. And now I know that my result is going to be a string. So I can manually typecast things like that, but obviously that's not ideal. And that is where TRPC comes in. It takes care of all those things where if I change my route names, if I change my variable names, and it takes care of my typing, which is really important. Now here what I've done is I swapped over everything to using TRPC and I'm gonna go through, we have almost exactly the same files with only one additional file. And you'll notice the actual Express server itself is very similar. There's only a few changes. As you can see here, we're using this create Express middleware function, which we can come in from TRPC. TRPC has adapters for pretty much anything you can think of. If you just search here, you can see that we have a bunch of different adapters that we can use. And in our case, we're using an Express adapter because we have an Express application, but most people are probably gonna use something like Next.js and use this with React. Anyway, we create this Express middleware, and the important thing is we pass it a router, which defines all of our different routes, very similar to how we did it in the normal Express purpose. And then we have an optional context we can pass. In our case, we're just using an empty object because we have no context at all. Now, the next thing we need to do is actually create a TRPC object. We just need to initialize TRPC. You only need to do this once in your app. You should never do it more than once. So in a separate file, I've just created my TRPC thing. I called it T, and that's all this file does. It's just making sure I only ever call this init function one time. Then we have our different routes and you notice we have our index route and we have our user route and a lot of this is very similar. If you look here, we have a t.router. This is creating a router for us, essentially just like you would do inside of Express. And we're defining the different routes we have. We have a greeting route and we have an error route and then we have some routes for our users. So these are like our nested routes in our case. So at slash users, we can get to all these routes. But as you can see here, we have a greeting route and it is a procedure that just essentially means it's some type of function. We define the input of that function. I'm using Zod in this case as a validation library. If you're unfamiliar with Zod, I actually have two full videos covering it. I'll link them up in the cards and description for you. But essentially Zod, we can just define what our input looks like. So we're saying this is an object that is a name that is a string. We can even come in aside here and have things like a minimum of three, for example. But in our case, we're just saying that it is a string, super straightforward. Then it's giving us a request object. And this request object has essentially two properties. We have our input, which in our case, we know matches this input right here. So we know it's going to have a name that's a string. And look, we get type safety. You can see that it knows this is a string. So we get autocomplete and type safety, which is really great. The other thing that's on here is going to be a CTX object, and this is just going to match whatever you pass into your context here. So for example, if I wanted to get a session ID, I could just come in here and say session ID is going to be my request.cookies.session ID, and now every single request is going to get that session ID. But you know, it's not important. In our case, we're not using any type of session, so this is just an empty object. Now, if we go back to here, you can see that's all we get with our request object. And all we do is just return whatever we want to send down to the client. So this is really nice because it's a lot simpler than doing like an express API server, because all we do is we treat this like a normal function. We define the inputs for our function, and then we return a value from our function. And that's how it's going to work on the client. We're going to call this just like it's a normal function. And that's why it's so easy to work with. Here we have our error. And if we have an error, we just throw an error like any other time. That's perfectly fine. Now, if we look at our actual user routes, you'll notice that it again is very similar. We have a route for getting a user by ID. As you can see, it's a query that returns to us a user based on our input, which in our case is just a string. And then finally, we have a create function. The only difference here is this is going to be changing some data. So we call this a mutation instead of a query. Again, we're going to be adding our user and then we're returning that user down to the client. And in our main.ts, this file is almost exactly the same. All the code down here is pretty similar. The main difference is that we need to import essentially the ability to create a TRPC client and this HTTP batch link from TRPC client. Also, we need to import the types of our router and that is defined 
right inside of our index here, you can see we're exporting this type app router, which is a type of our router. So our top level router, which in our case is called app router, it has a type, we need to export that type, and then we need to use that in the client to create our proxy. And that's what gives us that type safety between our client and our server. This type right here makes all of that work. And then since we defined our route at slash trpc, here I'm just adding slash trpc to the end. And this batch link thing is really nice. It just essentially allows you to batch a bunch of different API calls that all happen at the same time into one call to the server. And it's going to return the results for all of those in one call. So it kind of gives you some of the advantages of GraphQL where it does like one call to get a bunch of information. But in this case, it's just batching a bunch of individual calls, doing them all at once and returning all the data at once just to save you some round trip cost. Now, if we look at our code, the actual way that we call this is a little bit different. You know that we have on our routes a dot greeting. So we can use our client and just say dot greeting dot query. And that's very similar to what we have here. We have a greeting, which is a query. Super straightforward. So we call client dot greeting dot query just as a normal function and we pass it our input, which in our case is a name of Kyle. And it returns to us that result. And if you check here, this result is typed already for us to a string because TypeScript knows that this was returning a string for us. And if I change this to say greetings and I give this a quick save, you notice immediately we're getting an error right here saying, hey, this does not exist. There's no greeting. Change this to say greetings. Or if I change this to say names, I'm going to get an error because there is no names property. It is a property of name. So this is really nice. Now we have perfect type safety. And if I want to rename this to say just, you know, greeting, just like that, I renamed it in one place it's going to rename it everywhere in my application. Now to even further illustrate why this is so amazing, if we just comment some more code out here, as you can see, if we just take this, let's comment this in. This is me just getting a bunch of different users by ID. So normally this would take six different requests, but with the way that the batching of these requests happens, if I go to my network tab, you'll notice that we only actually have one request. Let me just expand this super far here. You'll notice that we have one request. We technically have two because it's doing an options request. Just ignore that. But this request right here is a git. And as you can see in our preview, if I just move this out of the way, we're getting the results for all six of those queries happening at the exact same time. So it's batching all six of those queries, doing all six of them at once, and then returning the data for all six of them at the same time. That's super nice and it's so much easier than having to batch that all on your own. And it just saves your users a little bit of bandwidth, which is really cool. Another thing is if you want to do a mutation, it's super simple. All you do right here, you just do your normal thing. So client.users.create that perfectly follows our .users.create. We're doing a mutation, which directly maps to that mutate function right here, mutation. And we're just passing in the data that we want. And it's going to return to us whatever that mutation returns, which in our case is just a normal user. And if we give this a save, you can see it created a brand new user for us. And we even have a git function right here that'll get us that brand new user. And as you can see, it returns the exact same data for both of those. The real power here of TRPC over something like a standard REST client is it makes it easier to talk to your server because it's just calling functions. That's essentially all you're doing. You're calling a function and it directly calls the function on your server. At least that's what it feels like when you're writing the code. And it gives you that perfect type safety, just like you were calling a normal function. That type safety is going to be there for you. So no matter what happens, if you change the name of your route and you click save, if you're using that route somewhere, for example, here, you're going to get an error immediately because that route does not exist. I really love that. And that's definitely my favorite feature of TRPC. Now, I know you're probably curious to actually check out this code yourself and see how it works between the TRPC version and the actual REST version. So I'm going to link a GitHub repository in the description below that's going to have all of this code so you can compare and contrast it. And really, I'd focus on these five main files that I talked about in this video. I absolutely love TRPC and I'm currently working on a full tutorial of TRPC, which when it's done, it's going to be linked over here. But in the meantime, I recommend you check out my Zod tutorial, which is also going to be linked over here because it's really integrated with TRPC. With that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.